Hello everyone, I'm Captain Logan and it's not Spawn Year. Clearly, it's day 21 of my comic review video day calendar, and today I'm going to check out some Ninja Turtles. I picked an obscure, random issue based solely on the cover. I'd never looked at this before, but have had these in my collection for quite a while. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures from 1992. And Ninja Turtles, just broadly, was requested on the community tab uh, by, in a post that I did there a couple of days ago, uh, as of this uh, recording, you're going to see this about a week and a half after I put it together, uh, but Christopher Garrett asked me to do a Ninja Turtles comic, and of course, I've got lots of Ninja Turtles, and I was going to do this at some point, but it's earlier now, thanks to Mr. Garrett. And I meant to mention this on yesterday's show, but I also had a request for Resurrection Man, which I had planned on doing at some point, but you're probably getting it earlier than I would have from Gooster123. I put my feelers out and asked folks, just because I want to involve you guys a little bit here and there as much as I can, uh, what characters and books I should take a look at. And a lot of people requested things that I simply don't have uh, a copy of, but uh, I'm trying to do some of the ones that I do for you guys uh, that, that I actually have. And I'll probably buy some more random things throughout the year so I could end up with more uh, characters and things that I don't currently have access to uh, physically. Of course, I could be reviewing everything digitally. There's a lot of access these days, but uh, part of the reason I wanted to do this, as I've said before, is to get back in touch with my own personal physical collection again because I don't have enough of excuses to get into my long boxes since I read more digital now. But also, and I haven't said this before, one of the reasons I thought to do it this way uh, is just as a callback to Spawn here, maybe I shouldn't spell this out, but we're going to be looking at a comic today that is very heavy-handed, so I might as well be as well, but Spawn Year, I had everything physically, and back then I had to because there was no way to get access to Spawn Comics digitally, so I had to do that. Uh, there were some issues I spent $30, $40 on it just to do them on Spawn Year, and as I've mentioned before, I don't have those books anymore. I sold them, and I sometimes regret that a little bit. I guess I brought that up again just yesterday. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's kind of nice to do the Spawn Year thing and go back to a physical single issues that I have. Hey, today we're going to look at a really bizarre issue of Ninja Turtles, and I grabbed this one because I thought the cover was striking and just weird. You've got, this is a Peter Laird drawing, and you've got Donatello with not the world on his back, but the year 1492. And at first glance, I wasn't even sure if it would have anything to do with the year. It's just like, that's weird. The number, the numbers 1, 4, 9, and 2 are on Donatello's back, and he is in a very dynamic pose that harkens back to Atlas holding it on his back uh, all by his lonesome. And uh, it's it's very strange. And I was like, I'm reviewing this. I don't care what's inside. And what's inside is truly weird and is a striking contrast, a stark contrast to what you see on the cover. And a lot of the issues of this book were like this, where the cover does not match in tone at all what you see inside. So this is the cover, and if you have not been looking at this book at all, you might think that you're in for a very Eastman and Laird-looking story, and that this is intended more for a teenage or adult audience, right? Check out, the, check out the contrast between the cover and the first page. Are you ready? There's Donatello. Get that in your head. There's Donatello in the bottom two panels. Uh, this is what this book looks like inside. Uh, it is drawn to intentionally to look like the cartoon show, and it was a tie-in to the 87 series from the beginning. So there is a four or five issue arc that opens the story that, if memory serves, is, I haven't looked at this in a while, is just a adaptation of the uh, miniseries that begins the cartoon show. I may be wrong about that, but it starts off uh, looking and acting a lot more like that TV show. And then very quickly, when the writer who is here uh, all the way in into issue 40 uh, takes over, 
issue four or five, real real early, uh, it goes its own way and is, by comparison, uh, at, at least relatively to the show, a little bit edgier and is uh, a little bit more sophisticated. Um, and I say that in air quotes, and you'll see why as you look at this this issue. This is a really good sampling of the oddness of this book, although of the few issues that I've looked at, this is definitely the strangest one. This is not the first of these I will have reviewed. Um, I did a scripted review, and I don't know why I wrote that, but I did a scripted review a few years ago of the Future Shark Trilogy, which I think happens shortly after this. This is also a time travel thing, and this is, I guess, the first time the Ninja Turtles, according to this anyway, have dealt with time travel and even realize it's possible, and they do indeed wind up back in the year 1492 and come face-to-face -face with Christopher Columbus as he lands on Plymouth Rock. That is the premise of this. It's really weird. So before I get into that, though, uh, let me mention for a second the writer and uh, artist here. Uh, pencils by Chris Allen, who I don't know anything about. I d couldn't find uh, much on him, but and I don't know if he was a regular or a fill-in because uh, I haven't looked at the issues around this, but Dean uh, Clarain is the regular staff writer on this book, and he was the managing editor for uh, Archie for, for uh, the Ninja Turtles books at, at this time. And he uh, was the reason that this book was so PSA heavy. I uh, made it a lot about trying to bring you know major issues, uh, real life issues to kids' attention and have uh, a lot of moral lessons, particularly about the environment and animal rights. And. Of course, I don't have any issue telling stories about that, but this is real heavy-handed. Uh, as much or most, more so as that Pizza Hut uh, Real Heroes Marvel book that I did a few days in. And it also blindsides you. You have no idea looking at the front of this that that's what this is going to be like. Uh, I meant to say this earlier, man. The Again, just going from the cover to the first page, it's like if you watched the intro to the 2003 cartoon series, and then what you got instead was an episode of 87. Um, do I want to run down the story first or talk about the weirdness and all the mistakes in the art? Uh, let's go ahead and go through the story real quick, um, at the risk of you guys noticing all the stuff I'm about to bring up uh, in, in the art. We'll make it a scavenger hunt. There are mistakes. There are lots of them. See if you can spot them before I point them out while I'm telling you what happens in this book. So the first page is a recap of whatever adventure the Turtles went on in the issue before this. Uh, they save some people. Right away, uh, somebody says, thanks for taking that bullet out of my chest, which is not a line you would ever hear in the 87 cartoon series because of censorship and because of the target audience. And this is, this has an identity crisis about who the target audience is. Uh, because I think m more often than not, you'd probably have like eight, nine, 10 year olds reading this book. Although this far into the cartoon series, maybe you would get some tweens and teenagers uh, because like I said, this is five years after the series begins, and I actually have the fifth anniversary, um, n now that I'm remembering it, I wish I had thought to pull that out, but I have the fifth anniversary, like, statue action figure that they put out for that, but... You know, you'd think that this would be... I'm going to keep talking about this cover. You'd think, looking at this cover, uh, and like I said, a lot of the covers were like this. I don't know how many of them were drawn by Eastman or Laird, and if Eastman was doing anything with this book. I should mention also that this writer... And by the way, um, that is a pseudonym uh, for this writer, Dean Clarain. I don't know why he wrote under a pen name. But his real name was, uh, well, and I say was, I think he's still around. Um, I don't know that he is working in comics anymore. His last credit is around 07. But he is named uh, Stephen Murphy 
is the actual guy. So if you look him up on Wikipedia, uh, Dean Clorain, it will um, auto-jump you to Stephen Murphy's Wikipedia page. Anyway, he was also a writer on the 2003 cartoon series, and he was on that staff. And that makes me think that he and Laird uh, were probably close and worked together more closely maybe than he did Eastman because Laird was the uh, consultant on uh, of the two on the 03 show. So the 2000, if you're not aware, the 2003 show is uh, very heavily aimed in a more Peter Laird direction in his storytelling sensibilities and his, his focuses of what he liked to deal with with the Ninja Turtles. And Kevin Eastman uh, was the consultant for the 2012 show, and it had much more of his sensibilities. And the 87 cartoon, of course, was all about selling action figures and was uh, a lot more kiddified. So kind of neat that each of those guys got their own TV show. And I can't tell you what's happening in that fourth cartoon show, which does not feel like it has very much to do with the Ninja Turtles at all. Though I've heard good things about the movie that capped off that whole show on Netflix. Maybe I'll watch that and finally review it at some point. Uh, what is that? I'm, well, I'm struggling to remember the name of that show. It's not Tales of the, of the Ninja Turtles, um, or is it? I, I, I can't remember. What is that show called? Anyway, um, it's on the tip of my tongue. So... 1492 here, uh, the Turtles go through the Bermuda Triangle, and there's a big storm, and they get washed up on a beach with some other mutate friend they have, I guess, so that we have a girl in this comic. I forget her name. Uh, it comes up somewhere. I'll find it. And they also Splinter is there, and Splinter looks really odd uh, in this series. He's got much more of a like, kind of teddy bear face uh, than a mutant rat face. But very quickly, they realize, oh, no, uh, we're in, we've gone back in time, and that's Christopher Columbus. And Donatello, because he does machines, and I guess that means that he's also more familiar with history than anything, uh, he likes technology of all kinds. He immediately recognizes the ships and knows that that's the Nina the Pinta and the Santa Maria, and right away it seems like it's playing on kids, under, like, like a simple, watered-down understanding of history especially when you get to the really heavy-handed moral lesson at the end. Uh, or I, I guess I should say just, like, education. Uh, th this book is basically just coming right out and screaming, what you've been told in school about this event is wrong, and I'm going to set you straight in a throwaway, ostensibly escapist Ninja Turtles comic. So they come face-to-face -face with Christopher Columbus, uh, and he does not seem to be uh, very shocked at all to see uh, mutates. Um, and he thinks that they are, of course, you wouldn't write this this way now, uh, but he, he thinks that they're Indians. I think he says uh, Indios, and that they must be the natives, and that he's gone so far in one direction that uh, human beings don't even look human anymore. And so he grabs uh, Donatello in order to throw somebody in uh, the brig and get uh, information about them. And so the turtles are working on some kind of a rescue plan while uh, Donatello is talking to uh, Christopher Columbus, of all people. And Columbus is uh, talking about how money, and I guess this is the moral lesson, money makes the world go round. Everything he's doing is about gold, not exploration. This is something of a don't meet your heroes moment for Donatello. I guess he had the same crappy public education that the rest of us did in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, meanwhile, the turtles are just kind of moping, trying to figure out what they're going to do. They end up fighting some of Christopher Columbus's men and... Uh, or or is it just the natives here? I forget. What they do is really not important because ultimately the whole thing pivots and it's not really about the turtles figuring out how to get back to the future or rescuing Donatello or anything. The whole thing comes down to a conversation between Donatello and this really weird Muppet-looking creature 
called the other and he she it is an earth spirit that reminds me a little bit of the pantheon of gods that you get in the idw ninja turtle series and this creature this thing explains to donatello that he knows uh, everything about donatello that he knows everything about the, the the history of the earth and why this has happened to them and so the idea is, and it's very convoluted and silly, uh, is that there is a, they're in a, a weird power spot in history. And that when two really important things happen on a major anniversary in the same place, time converges and characters from the past and the present can temporarily wind up in the same place together and interact. And there is kind of a philosophical debate, apparently, between the other and its peers about whether Christopher Columbus created this power spot, as he describes it, because he does this very important historical thing that's going to matter to the rest of history, or if it's the other way around, uh, that Christopher Columbus was, uh, like, unbeknownst to him, drawn to this power source because it was this, the, this power source, the power spot, whatever. And so exactly 500 years, of course, the timing is very convenient, exactly 500 years after uh, Columbus and the, the other makes a big deal out of, you know, he didn't, Columbus didn't discover America. There were already people here. Uh, he says millions of people here. I don't know um, j just how many inhabitants there were. Uh, of this area at that time, but uh, and I don't know how many millions we're talking, but but anyway, I digress. I I had I had questions through this. Um, the other says that uh, because these two important things happen at the same time, I uh, five because you came here 500 years after Columbus did. Now you're together in the same plane uh, at the same time. It's it's very weird. And it kind of reads like somebody just woke up one day and went, hey, that's crazy. It's the 500th anniversary of uh, Columbus coming to America. We got to do a comic about that. Maybe this came out on Columbus Day or something. I don't know. Um, I, didn't, I didn't check the month th this came out. But ultimately, the other gives uh, Donatello this uh, long, sad story about how, of course, the Europeans... Uh, when they when they came to America, mistreated the Native Americans and all the diseases they brought with them, and that they uh, you know pushed them out of their homes, and then he starts talking about slavery and the, the way that uh, the natives were turned into slaves, but also everything that happened with Africans, and all of a sudden it just becomes this big speech about how awful. All these people were treated, and then that's kind of the the end of the comic. Uh, like that speech happens, and then they uh, there, there's another big storm, and I guess all the turtles have been doing is getting to the right spot so they can jump off of a ship and get back in the ocean, uh, and then they wind up back where they started at the beginning. And it's almost exactly the same shot, except now instead of seeing Columbus's ships, uh, Donatello sees a cruise ship. And because uh, they were hoping to go to the Bahamas before they went back to New York. And then uh, they go on the cruise ship, and then I guess they go home, and there's the Statue of Liberty, and that's it. And apparently the next issue, there's something about a prehistoric mammoth, and I don't know if that has anything to do with the time travel that we just experienced, or if that's a completely separate adventure that is totally unrelated. But this is a truly baffling ending. Does anybody remember anything that happened here? Was it all in Donatello's head? I think that's entirely possible given that we don't check back in with anybody, they don't have a conversation about this, there's no epilogue, and they get washed up on shore from the storm here exactly the same way they did at the beginning, and Donatello says the same thing. Oh yeah, the storm, not oh yeah, the other, and all of that. So 
Maybe it all just happened for Donatello. Maybe it was just in his head. I'm sure the other shows up again somewhere later, and maybe there's some sort of a payoff for this. I don't know, but it's really strange. And again, it feels like it exists just so that kids will know that they maybe got a watered-down history in school and that uh, things are more complicated than they thought and that uh, we have looked at this uh, point in history with rose-tinted glasses. And, of course, that's changed a lot. Uh, but at this point, th that really was what a lot of us were taught, uh, was, was that everything was hunky-dory between the Europeans and the Native Americans and that it was very kumbaya and they lived together in harmony and uh, that's of course just not how it was uh, and we we kind of you know turned Columbus into more of a heroic figure than maybe he, he, he should have been uh, but anyway I uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about like I said is insane mistakes so the colorist, and I, I'm not going to name any names here because I don't want to throw this person under the bus, but you've got a colorist here who seems very confused as to who is talking when, and this makes the best case I've ever seen for this iteration of the Turtles, even though this is uh, a little bit more interesting and a little bit more, again, sophisticated than the cartoon show, uh, that the cartoon iteration of the Turtles, they are too interchangeable and they have kind of their one prevailing character trait and that's it and it's hard to tell them apart otherwise because they all kind of talk the same and are sort of about the same things with just superficial differences the colorist seems to agree because constantly every other page or better there is dialogue being spoken that is clearly supposed to be in one turtle's mouth that winds up in the other, and even weirder stuff will end up happening. So I'm going to go page for page with the things that I noticed here. So here's the first one that jumped out at me. Top of the page here, Splinter says, keep your, this is when they first come up on the shore, keep your weapons sheathed, act friendly like the natives, and smile, even you, Raphael, and then above and then right behind him, Michelangelo says, yes, master. So right away, something's off. I'm like, wait a minute, that's that's orange. And like, maybe I'm colorblind. Maybe that's supposed to be red. But it isn't, and you'll see that in a little bit, uh, because this will keep happening. So then, the very next page, we'll just do a kindergarten exercise here. Does anything seem off about this page? Anything jump out at you as, uh, as wrong, as, as, as incorrect? Why are there two Leonardos in the middle of that page? There's two of them. Like, this would have been less distracting if it was like the covers of the uh, Eastman and Laird books initially where all the turtles have the same headband color. And they have even the monograms on the belt buckles. And there are places where, for the most part, that matches. But there are places even with that where Michelangelo will be uh, talking, but it's clearly supposed to be Raphael, even though you see Michelangelo's monograph, or monogram or vice versa. Uh, okay, continuing on here, uh, we're going to get to a place on the beach here. Yeah, okay, so at the top here. At first, I wasn't sure there was anything wrong here, but there's a payoff later that makes it clear that it's messed up. So Raphael is talking about being hungry which is a more typical Michelangelo thing. Ah, oh, all I want right now is pizza. And then right next to Raphael saying that, and uh, both of them look real jaded, is Michelangelo saying, I'm, I'm uh, tired of standing around waiting for something to happen. I want to make something happen. So that sounds more like Raphael. He's impulsive. He wants to rush off and be a hothead, right? So it seems like we've flipped the script with these two characters. I don't know. Maybe they're just feeling differently this time. Except, uh, later on, you're going to see Michelangelo complaining about being hungry. Which reminds me, I'm hungry. But that's what Raphael was complaining about earlier, so clearly that was a mistake. Then, look at the bottom of this page. Damsels in distress, I think. Leo and Raph called it. You're Raphael. Raphael is saying that. Just constantly. 
I, it's like somebody's colorblind. Somebody doesn't know the difference between Raphael and uh, Michelangelo, at least in headband color, and uh, the difference between blue and... Is it purple? Is it supposed to be Donatello standing next to Leonardo? I think maybe. I'm really not sure which turtle is which there. Is there... A, sorry, I'm flipping back through these again. Uh, I think that's that's uh, all, or at least most of the odd mistakes here. Uh, but yeah, so this one is uh, fascinating on multiple levels, and I'm very glad that I grabbed it on a whim. Anyway, that's all I have to say about that one. Thanks a bunch for tuning in. Uh, I didn't mean to do a whole 25 minutes on this issue, but uh, it was weird. There was, there, there was a lot there. And I'll be back with you again tomorrow, of course, with another one. I was Captain Logan, and happy reading, everybody.